Hi, uh, I'm Andrew Sheff, and this is my summer with Iron Monkey. A little bit about me. Uh, I'm from Chicago. Um, I go to Brown University. This is a picture of the computer science building, which is where I spend most of my time. Uh, this is a picture of me playing baseball. It's something I really like to do. And uh, this is a picture of me and my family all wearing our Firefox shirts. Um, I spent my summer working on Ion Monkey. It's the next JavaScript JIT for Firefox and for everyone. Uh, JIT stands for Just In Time. It's a kind of compiler that compiles sections of code at runtime, just in time for use. Uh, SpiderMonkey, Firefox's JavaScript engine, uh, has a history of several JITs, TraceMonkey, JaegerMonkey, and now IonMonkey. Uh, and what's new with IonMonkey is that it has a standard general intermediate representation of the code, so we can run good old tried and true compiler optimizations on our JavaScript code. It also has type inference and compiles to native code like its predecessors, and that is a, a boost for speed as well. My uh, particular good old compiler optimization that I implemented was loop invariant code motion. Um, the idea of loop invariant code motion is this we take a function that has uh, a loop and some computation done inside of the loop that the result of it is the same every time. Here we can see that a plus b is always 9, no matter what iteration of the loop we're in. The goal is to remove this a plus b from the loop, put it outside, um, and assign it to a new variable. Here I use c, and then reference the variable c from within the loop instead. Um, doing this, we've saved a thousand additions uh, from our code. There's sort of three steps to the algorithm. Uh, one is identifying loop instructions. Uh, then we need to determine uh, whether these instructions are invariant within the loop. Uh, and then we need to move the instructions above the loop. Uh, my LICM algorithm uh, operates on a control flow graph, which is one of those standard intermediate representations uh, of, that IonMonkey supports. Uh, control flow graph is uh, it's common. It's used in many modern compilers. Uh, and it's essentially a flow chart representation of the program, where each node represents straight line uh, code without any branching or looping. And edges between blocks uh, represent possible branches and loops and the control flow of the program. This is the control flow graph um, for the function I just showed you. Um, the first block uh, represents sort of the initialization of the variables. Um, the B1 block is the header of the loop, the for statement. And um, the B3 block is the body of the loop. And B2 represents the return statement. Now, my algorithm also takes advantage of SSA, which stands for single static assignment, um, another one of those common standard representations that you see in many modern compilers. The idea with SSA is that we rewrite the program so that each variable is assigned only once, and if we assign a variable again, we make a new variable name. Um, doing this allows us to be really, allows it to be very clear when variables are assigned and when they change. Because when a we know with single static assignment that a variable once assigned never changes. And we'll see how this helps in determining loop invariance. So um, we'll rewrite this in SSA. To start, it looks more or less the same. Um, we initialize variables uh, the same way. Each block ends with a control instruction, which says which block it can go to, which block or blocks it can go to next. Um, now in the loop header, we initialize the variable i to zero. That actually should belong in the block above the loop because that doesn't happen every iteration of the loop. Um, then we test i against 1,000. That happens every time in the loop. And the final increment of i happens sort of at the end of the loop body. Um, now, um, what we want to do is, is increment i1 by 1, but because this is single static assignment, we can't increment i1. We have to make it a new name, so we'll call it i2. Um, and then when we go back to block 1, when we go around the loop, this creates a problem because now we're testing i1 against 1,000, but we want to be testing i2. So the way we resolve this is with a special instruction called a fee instruction. And it takes in two definitions and essentially gives the result of the one that we saw last. So if in block one, this fee instruction, if coming from block zero, will assign to i3 the value of i1. But if coming from the body of the loop, it will assign to i3 the value of i2. And what we need to do then is just replace the uses of i1 with i3. And we're all set. We have single static assignment. Um, and it works coming from block zero and from block three. Uh, moving on to the body of the loop, uh, we have uh, the computation of a plus b and the, the addition of that onto the result value. Um, again, um, adding onto the, that r2 creates a uh, problem that can only be resolved with the fee node, the fee instruction. So we add that and replace um, the usage of r1 with r3, um, and then make a return statement, and, and everything works. So 
Uh, just a little bit of terminology, the things on the left side are going to call them definitions, and on the right are the operands for a definition. Now, determining loop invariance, uh, we're going to take our two blocks that are in the loop and look at every instruction. Um, and because values stored in variables never change, because it's SSA, all we need to do is check that for each definition, where are the operands defined? If both operands are not defined within this loop, then they cannot possibly change within this loop, and we're safe to move that entire definition and its operands above the loop. So we look at the instructions one by one. Uh, this instruction, this definition for R3 depends on R2, which is assigned within the loop, so it's not safe to hoist this above the loop. Likewise, uh, I3 depends on I2, which is defined within the loop and changes in the execution of the loop, so I3 is not loop invariant. Uh, this test instruction depends on I3, which is set within the loop, so this will never, uh, this will not always yield the same result, um, so we cannot move that. T1, on the other hand, its operate operands, A1 and B1, are assigned nowhere in this loop. Therefore, because it's single static assignment, we know that A1 and B1 will never change throughout the course of this loop, and therefore T1 will never change. So we can move T1 out of the loop. That's We're going to start that one. Um, with R2 and I2, they both have operands that are defined in the loop, so they are not loop invariant. So we have our instruction that we can move, um, and we simply move it. We put it right before that last instruction uh, in, at the end of uh, block zero. So I did this, and I saw that it worked with, in the control flow graph, um, and I wanted to test it and benchmark it and see the improvement uh, in performance. But uh, I quickly saw that LIC, well, while LICM runs on an intermediate representation, um, IonMonkey didn't yet produce any actual code to run into benchmark. So I switched gears for a while, and I started working on getting IonMonkey to run its own code. And my, one, of my, one of my big parts in doing that was a, a piece called the trampoline. The idea of a trampoline is we want to jump from the IonMonkey engine into a JavaScript function. And IonMonkey is written in C++, so how do you call a compiled JavaScript function from C++? Well, we take advantage of calling conventions. Calling conventions is, are, is an agreement between the caller of a function and the function itself. The caller places functions uh, places function arguments by a certain convention, and then the callee knows exactly where to find the arguments because it is assuming that the caller is using a particular calling convention. C++ and our compiled JavaScript have different conventions. C++ arguments are in registers on the call stack or maybe passed by pointers. Uh, JavaScript callee wants all arguments as values on the call stack in, a, in the right order and has some other requirements as well. So uh, just a little visual way of thinking about it. We have our C++ function caller that has a particular calling, uh, one particular calling convention, and our JavaScript callee that has a different, expecting a different calling convention. So we, there needs to be a piece in the middle that takes the arguments uh, passed through with one calling convention and reorders them and resets them according to the convention that the JavaScript expects. So how, a little bit of how it works is you have a C++, a C++ function that kind of looks like this. Um, and you call this method. The parameters are a pointer to memory, which represents the start of the compiled JavaScript code. Uh, the number of arguments, a vector of JavaScript values representing the arguments, and a value of a, a slot to put the result, the return value of the function. So um, we call this method, and the arguments are placed by the C++ convention. Then we need to replace those arguments by compiled JavaScript convention, and we need to do this in assembly language. Now, assembly uh, was a new thing for me because uh, in school when I learned assembly, I used it to program little toy examples like Conway's Game of Life, which is fun, but programming in real life x86 assembly is, is very different. There's a lot more things you have to worry about. So um, what the assembly code that I wrote does is it loops over this argv pointer, moves each argument onto the call stack in the right order, and then jumps into the passed-in code pointer, and when it returns back out, when the JavaScript function returns back out, it takes the return value um, and puts it in the result, uh, uh, stores it in the result variable. And it's not quite as easy as just four bullet points. So there's a lot of issues. For example, our compiled JavaScript expects a 16-byte stack alignment. So if you have, say, an odd number of, uh, of uh, arguments, you may need to push some bytes of padding onto the stack to enforce this alignment. Um, also, you need to be careful of, of register stomping because 
the JavaScript function has free reign to use any processor registers that it wants. So if you expect something to stay in a register, you have to be sure to save it on the call stack before you jump into the JavaScript function. And then there are also different processor architectures. I implemented these trampolines on 32-bit and 64-bit x86, and they have vastly different uh, calling conventions, so the trampolines look up rather different. So um, now, after doing that, we ran uh, and also implementing some uh, branching and comparison statements to help my loops um, look good, uh, I was able to do some benchmarks. So at first I ran um, the function on the left with without LICM, and, I, and it took about 3 milliseconds, and then I ran it again with LICM, and it took still about 3 milliseconds. Um, and the reason why uh, it did this is because, well, the loop computation here, it's only a thousand iterations, uh, and it's only one or two additions in the loop. That's done on the order of microseconds, and we don't even see the difference uh, the difference here. Um, most of those three milliseconds are um, system overhead of calling the function and placing uh, parameters and returning and, and this sort of thing. So um, I bumped it up to 100 million iterations and then I saw a difference. Uh, without LICM the, the code ran in 156 milliseconds and with LICM it ran in 127 milliseconds which is 18 percent faster. It's a, a pretty big, inc a pretty big um, speed increase. And then I decided to write uh, more of an extreme example to really um, see LICM at work. And um, this function took 33 milliseconds without LICM. And with LICM, it took only 14 milliseconds, which is over double the speed. Um, it's a huge improvement. And looking at this example, you may say, well, I would never write code that looks like that. It's clear that the value a plus b plus c plus d plus e plus f doesn't change through within the loop. I would definitely make that computation outside. But I'm, I will argue that this sort of uh, situation isn't too far-fetched if you imagine an image processing algorithm that loops over the pixels of an image and uh, applies a 3x3 three three matrix multiplication to each pixel. And maybe the matrix is scaled by a, a factor. You have to divide by some coefficient. And the matrix is constant. Well, then each of those divisions, those nine divisions, are loop invariant. And those could be a real performance boost to move those computations outside of your loop. Um, I'll just close by saying that my uh, internship here at Mozilla was awesome, um, and that's an overused word around here, but it really means a lot to me. Um, I got to work on a project as uh, significant as Ion Monkey. It's crucial to the future of Mozilla and Firefox, um, and the community as well, and I got to work on a really important part of it, um, and I learned just a ton about compilers and uh, modern compilers at that. I came in knowing virtually nothing, and the culture of Mozilla is just uh, awesome and great people to work with, and it's very laid back and fun, and I, I just had a great time. And I just want to thank the college team, Julie Jill Kimber, and the JavaScript team, especially Dave Mandolin and David Anderson, um, my boss and, and mentor, and um, all the other interns uh, as well. It was just, it's been a great summer, and thank you very much.